Uh, you have a special insert about the uh, meetings we're going to have with our brother Eric DeVito, DeVito and uh, Saturday uh, afternoon and Sunday you'll be here as our guest speaker. And his wife is coming and she's going to provide special music, so we're looking forward to that. Um, that's uh, a special insert in your bulletin, which is all about that. So those are the announcements I have. And unless there's something else anyone has, we'll... Uh, yes, the uh, Monks and Munchkins, um, not October 8th. They're going to be meeting sometime after church on some Sundays. But you need some for details. Okay, all right. Um, very good, thank you. Our call to worship is Isaiah 55, verse 3. Incline your ear and come to me, that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Shall we open in prayer? <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, that you love so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that's the message of the Bible from cover to cover. The great love of God, the mercy and grace that he offers to mankind who sinned and offended him and walked away, yet there's a way back to Jesus Christ. We thank you for that this morning. Now, God, be with us. We know you're here. As we worship you, we praise you, we hear your word. We look forward to what you're going to say to us, individually, personally. Help us to be not just hearers, but doers of the word, I pray. So, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. 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 Good morning, saints. Good morning. Good morning. Obviously, our favorite uh, uh, Stanley is not here today to rouse you up, so I'm going to take his place and try to get you to sing out loud and with good spirits. And this morning, we're going to start off a song about a Redeemer who paid the price and purchased me in the kind of Arkansas of our Sunday school this morning, where you know our bodies are the temple of God and that we were purchased for a price. We should always remember that. So stand now with me, and we're going to sing 285 and sing loud with the Holy Spirit within you. I will sing of my redeemer. <laughs>
hard and I <laughs> her hard and tough. And I give praise for her service every week. The second song we're going to sing this morning is on a few pages back, Tim 277. He is Lord. Uh, no. <laughs> oh, that's what's in the vault and not a board. What do we got? What do you have? Oh, I, mean, I know because I changed it and I thought I had sent it to Liz, but maybe I didn't. Uh, I got 309. Okay, so we're going to go with organist and she's playing the music. <laughs> and we're going to go over to 309, all the name of Jesus. Or after me.
is the Sacandaga Fall Harvest Festival of the Sacandaga Bible Conference. It will be a good time. They will have all kinds of activities out there for adults and kids. If nothing else, there will be cider, donuts, other stuff to eat. And it's always fun to watch the kids, whoever's kids, uh, engage in some of the things they have. They probably are going to have the bungee swing out there for anybody who's really brave. They'll hook you up in a harness and put you up on a tower and let you go way down toward the woods and then back. No, I have never done it. No, I'm not going to do it. Uh, Don't forget the dump tank. And, and there will be a dump watch. tank, and I'm not going to do that either. I've done that this summertime, and that was enough. But Thank it's fun to watch. Okay. Um, Okay, we have some uh, grief share announcements, okay? Um, we have, we're starting up on the 22nd of October, correct? I gave, I gave the information to Liz, so okay. I didn't feel the post it in the... Uh, okay, so this is, this is the, this is, for, this is for a special thing here. Surviving the Holidays, yeah. it's a two-hour seminar on November 19th. So those, those are five, uh, Back in 
back in her EMT attire, and uh, very happy to be doing what she's doing. We're happy to have you. I like having an EMT right here in the church. <laughs> I really do. Actually, she's a paramedic. You, you still got your card for EMT, Kim? A little while uh, longer. Huh? A little bit longer. Yeah. A little bit longer? Okay, so, you know, it's nice when you got a congregation that, let's say, we're beyond that tender young age where we think we're invincible. <laughs> It's really nice having immediate help handy. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of goodies they keep in the truck with them, but I'm sure they're well equipped. So, all right, anything else going on? All right, let's pray. I will, just one other thing I am going to bring up. Everybody today, be sure you greet John Reedley because he's not going to be with us for at least a few months. John will be taking over as the at least interim pastor of the Springfield Center Church, First Baptist Church of Springfield Center. So we wish him well in that. And John, we are thrilled that we've had you among us. Uh, and if if you come back, great. And if they decide they're going to keep you forever, well, we know how those things work out. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning glorifying your name. We are thankful to be called your people. We're thankful to be called a church, a group that meets to glorify God. We are the called out from the culture. Help us to remain called out. Keep us pure in heart and in action and in deed. Keep us serving you. Keep us worshiping you in all that we do. Father, we put a lot of things before you this morning, particularly Shannon and Brian. Uh, that, it, it breaks our heart that our world has convinced people that the solution to something that may not be totally convenient, but it's actually a blessing, the blessing of a child, it breaks our heart that that's considered to be disposable. And Father, we pray that you strengthen Shannon and you break the heart of her husband. So that he realizes what he is doing is absolutely evil. Or what he's proposing is absolutely evil in your sight. Give him a sense of your presence that he cannot shake. Mm -hmm. We pray that whole situation is resolved for your glory. Father, we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray for that whole region. We know that there is age-old chaos there. This has not changed since the time of the conquest. When you brought your people into the promised land, the way you had promised to Abraham. And Father, nothing will change until you come again and make all things right, and put all things in subjection under your feet. And we wait that day. But in the meantime, Lord, we ask grace. We ask that you will be with the people of Israel. We ask that you will be the people with the people over in Palestine and the other places that are involved in the immediate conflict. Be with believers, be with the Jewish people who are interspersed with people who are violent and have nothing in mind but the destruction of Israel. So Father, we pray that you will actively work with Israel and against the enemy in that case. We ask you to be with our own nation, particularly the people in the south and the south central U.S. right now dealing with the hurricane aftermath and the volume of water that has come through, killing people, destroying communities, disrupting entire lives, entire families. And Father, we can't put ourselves in that position. But Lord, we know that you can work even in that. We pray for those organizations that are mounting relief efforts, our own Southern Baptist Convention and their disaster crews, uh, Samaritan's Purse, so many others that go in and try to minister to people, meeting both their physical and their spiritual needs. And we pray that throughout this whole thing, we will be glorified. And again, we are not wise enough to understand how that will happen, but we understand that you are sovereign. But Father, uh, we ask you to be with us on our day here today. We ask you to be with our worship, uh, specific worship time here. We set aside this hour to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise you deserve and you desire for your people. And now as we turn to that portion where we collect from our people, from our own selves, a portion of the blessings you've given us, we pray that you will take those gifts and use them for your glory in the church and through the church here. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
morning we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, the themes of the songs the last couple of weeks we've been going forward has been a lot about stepping out of faith and doing the things that the Lord needs us to do. And this song was operating in my mind when I started thinking about things we could be doing. It's called Potions Where Feet May Fail. And it's all about stepping out to the deep waters and remembering that even though Christ leads us into some scary places sometimes, that we aren't going alone. He is with us. We are His and He is ours. And to trust in that faith and that belief as we go about His work on the earth. And although I do love to sing, I recognize when a song belongs to a female voice. So, Thank you. 
strange of Judaism, go to, this, they call it temple, but it isn't. Uh, the temple was destroyed. But they, they attend a service on Sabbath. That is what they do. Okay. What Paul had been doing in this time, he was putting the plan of God into the perspective of the people of God. Telling them that they were the recipients of the salvation that God had promised. And now he begins a lesson in theology or Christology, talking about the Christ. This morning we're going to look at the rejection of Christ, the renunciation of Christ, and ultimately the resurrection of Christ. But first we're going to take this concept of Christ, and the word does not appear in our text this morning. We're going to take the concept of Christ and just expand on that a little bit. Uh, the Old Testament had a term, Messiah, or we get Messiah from it. I'll mispronounce it in, if I try it in Hebrew. Uh, but we get Messiah from it, and it means the anointed one. In Old Testament context, the anointed one was used, or the term anointed was used for a variety of people. For instance, Cyrus of Persia was anointed by God to restore Israel to Jerusalem. Cyrus of Persia was a heathen. So that's just what it was. Okay, the anointed, especially set apart. And very often we saw kings referred to as the Lord's anointed. So the Lord's anointed would be, for instance, David calling Saul the Lord's anointed, the king. And he referenced that and said, I will not lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. That's what it can be. And then there is the anointed, with the emphasis on that specific article, the anointed, or the anointed one. And this references Jesus Christ. None other. There can be no other. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about Christ in this concept and in this context. They've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for years for the Messiah. And when he came... He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. We see that in John. Okay? He came, and they didn't recognize him for what he was. The audience should have, by this point in time, as Paul is speaking, they should recognize that what they've been looking for, this son of David, this eternal son of David, to sit eternally on David's throne, was in fact Jesus Christ. So Paul continues that with the rejection of Christ. We have seen as we've studied this, this book of Acts, Peter preached the same issue back in Acts 3, right after he had healed the man at the gate of the temple, the gate called Beautiful at the temple. He got into a discussion and he began to preach and he talked about this and he said, and now brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of his prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. So Peter had laid it out quite forcefully. Peter never was one of his words. Those of us who know the accounts of Peter, he always said what was on his mind, and this is the case where he said what was on his mind, did a wonderful job with it. Uh, and this was Jerusalem. Don't forget Jerusalem, when Peter was talking in Jerusalem, in these accounts we have, this is pretty close on, pretty recent to the events of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it was also very close after Pentecost. It was within the first few years. And then a few years into this, we had Stephen and his sermon. He had strains of the same thought running through it as well. Chapter 7, verse 52 uh, of Acts. Uh, Stephen says, And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Once again, it wasn't sugarcoating anything there. We know how that ended for Stephen. He was stoned. It didn't stop him from having said his peace. But now we have this concept of Christ coming to his own and being rejected. And it's not in the text, but we know that Paul had also rejected, and he had in fact pursued the Christians in the early church, persecuting them. And then he had been marvelously converted. He was saved. He came to a personal meeting with Jesus Christ, supernatural meeting with Jesus Christ. Uh, so he was actually the best witness to testify to these things, especially in a 
crowd that will become more and more mixed and then turn over to being just Gentiles and who speaks to Peter preaching to. So here we are in Antioch, years later, miles away from the scene of the crime, as it were, after the Jews had rejected Jesus, and we're looking at that whole series of incidents there again, we have the renunciation of Jesus. When the Jews rejected him, they arrested him, they he was betrayed. We understand that story. We preach it over Easter. Betrayed. He was taken to Pilate. And Pilate, it's, Pilate's kind of an interesting character. There are sects of Christianity that refer to him as Saint Pilate. And, and I will cut him a little bit of slack. It does appear that he was trying to get Jesus free. He was trying, and he would read some of the conversation between him and Jesus, and it's almost like, give me something to work with here. Let me help you get out of this. Let me appease this people. But the people would not be appeased. And ultimately, Pilate capitulated because he was more afraid of Caesar than he was of Jesus. But before, well, he was, Jesus was before Pilate. The people were in the crowd and they were shouting, crucify him, away with him. And finally they said, we have no king but Caesar. This is the ultimate renunciation of the king of the Jews. And with that, they handed him over. He was killed. He rose again. We understand that story. But here it gets interesting as we look at our text because Paul references the term the tree. Okay? He said they, um, let me get back to it here. When they carried all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree. When Jesus died on the cross, they took him off the tree. And there's a couple of significant things there. Uh, number one, the Romans usually left people on the crosses for days as they slowly and agonizingly expired, pretty much drowning in their own blood and their own body fluids in their lungs. Because that's what would happen in that, in that posture. They were humiliated, there was total degradation, total humiliation. It was designed to teach the culture a lesson. This time, he didn't spend the night on the cross. And Paul uses the term tree, not the term cross, which is significant. Because if we go to Deuteronomy, chapter 21, 22, and 23, and if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. So here we have this picture of Christ on the tree, cursed by God, but he didn't remain all night. This is the singular place we have this documented for us. He didn't remain all night on the tree. He was taken down from the tree. He was something different. Peter used the same language of the tree in chapter 5, verse 30. We're not going to go there this morning because we're going to go to the resurrection of Christ. This is what separates us as Christians from every other religion in the world. It's often been said, if you could find the grave, you would find Confucius still in it. If you could find the grave of the Buddha, you would find the body still there or the bones still there. If you could find the grave of Muhammad, you would find the bones or the remains still there. Find the grave of Christ, and it's suspected we know where it is, where the tomb was. It's empty. Christ rose again by the mighty power of the Father. Okay? The Gospels record it. All of them record it. The book of Acts, chapter 1, also records it. 1 Corinthians 15. Now we're getting into some more detail here. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes this. After Christ had risen, he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve, of course, there were only 11 at that point, uh, then to more than 500 at one time, some of whom were still alive at the time of the writing. Then he appeared to James, and then to Paul himself. See, this was no legend, this was nothing made up. This was a witnessed event, and Paul in Corinthians was actually calling the doubters in the Corinthian church to go hunt down the other witnesses. You know, Paul said, I can name names. You want to go talk to them? I can tell you where to find them. So that was how 
sure of an event this is in history. We live in a time when people say, oh no, he didn't really die on the cross. Yes, he did. The Roman soldiers were experts in death. They knew that he was a dead man. And we have witnesses to his living again after the fact. But then we start going into the references that Paul goes into the Old Testament for. We've often made the observation, stolen from one of the older scholars, that the Old Testament is like a room richly furnished but dimly lit. Anybody ever walk into a room full of furniture in the dark? You stumble around a little bit. The Old Testament is best viewed in light of the New Testament. When we see the issue of the tree and look back to Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, we go, okay, I see. I see where that connects. And Paul, in his speech here before the, the church in Antioch, he lays out several things that they would be very familiar with, some Psalms and a piece from Isaiah. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And this is a rather confusing, un hard to understand passage. But apparently it's important because Paul not only uses it here, this is coming from Psalm 2, by the way, uh, he's not only using it here, but the writer of the book of Hebrews, which certainly was influenced by Paul, okay, it was somebody connected to Paul who wrote it, it's also used in the epistle of the Hebrews, okay, it's puzzling as they say, but it describes the unique relationship that God would have with the son of David, this root of Jesse, or, or offshoot of the root of Jesse. Uh, it describes not Jesus' birth, but the inauguration as king of kings. Paul is implying here that the promises God had made to David are being fulfilled, or had been fulfilled, with Jesus, his death, resurrection, and ascension to glory. Then he uses a passage which we've read this morning in our call to worship, Isaiah 55, 3. Incline your ear, come to me, hear that your soul may live, and I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. This is prophetic of Jesus there. And then he goes to Psalm 16, 10, and he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. All this is linking Jesus to the Old Testament, which this group would have known and trusted. He's building this bridge into their lives. So what's in this for me? What's in this for you? First of all, is the matter of bridge building. Paul has spent his time in this teaching segment building a bridge from the things his audience knew to the things he wished to teach them. The understanding of who Jesus Christ is. When we attempt to communicate the gospel to someone who does not know the gospel, is not familiar with the Bible, is not familiar particularly with who Jesus is, except maybe in the form of a curse word, okay, and maybe in the celebration of Easter, maybe in the celebration of Christmas, they may understand that he plays into that, but they don't really know all of who Jesus is, and all of what he has done, all of what he is doing. <clears throat> when we're trying to build a bridge into somebody's life, or I should say it this way, when we're trying to communicate the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that he died for our sins, that we can live eternity with him, not live an eternity in hell, when we're trying to communicate that, when we take the time to find out where the other people are. Paul knew where they were. Paul was a theologian's theologian in the Old Testament. He was a scholar's scholar. He understood where they were. When we talk to somebody, do we understand where they are? Do we understand what's going on in their lives? Do we understand the pressures that are going on maybe in their family, maybe among their friends, maybe in their workplace, maybe, maybe, maybe? Do we understand that? Do we take the time to explain to them how we really do care about them as a whole person? When we have disaster strikes, like are going on down in the south now, when we have those things strike, do people just go down there and stand on the street corner and preach? 
No, they do something to meet the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs first, and then they give them the gospel. When I did the ministry work in Latin America, we didn't just stand up in a police station someplace and start preaching the gospel. We taught them life-saving skills. And when you start mixing up with them, and I'm not going to say throwing each other around, but there was an element of that. Okay, we were pretty physical in our training. When we did that, it was to build a bridge into their lives. Now that we've showed that you're important to us, we're giving you a skill to save your life. Let's talk about eternity. And when we talk to our friends, our family, co-workers, do we let them know that they're important to us as people before we give them the gospel? Giving the gospel is a command. We are to share our faith. That's all about that song that we sang. It's a praise group. Okay? It's all about stepping out and sharing our faith. But we do that sensibly when we take this as a lesson from Paul as to how we go about it. Okay? He knew all these things. Every one of us has a specific set of histories, experiences, and skills that God can use to take the gospel to the next guy. Or the next gal. What's stopping us from doing that? Sometimes I think we forget about this. The promise of our resurrection. We go again to Paul's letter uh, to the Corinthians. The first letter. To, in uh, chapter 15, verse 19. He talks about it not being for this life only. Christ solves problems. There's no question about it. There's no problem, to quote Herschel New York, there's no problem so severe that it cannot be helped by a sufficient application of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's be very clear on that. The gospel applies to all situations in one way or another. But Paul wrote to them, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Another translation says, We are of all men most miserable. Kind of like that better says a little more strongly. We go a little bit further in the same letter. We get an explanation. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Remember Adam and Eve were told, don't eat of that fruit, the day you eat of it, you will die. Well, they didn't die that day, but that day began the process of death. That's when their bodies began to age and decay. Okay, so we know that to be the case. But one man caused that sin, caused the death, and then we have the death of Christ and his resurrection. Since by one sin, by one comes the resurrection. For all of us who believe, he goes on to say, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? What a marvelous thing to look forward to. You know, 15 years ago, I kind of thought I was invincible. Most of us at young age, particularly men, we think we're invincible. And then all of a sudden things start to happen. This hurts. That hurts. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. I have false teeth, hearing aids, glasses. You know, it, it would be nice if I didn't have all those things. But I do. We are dying. Slowly. Maybe some of us will live long, healthy lives and just all of a sudden, you know, be taken from life. If that happens to you, wonderful. Not happening that way with me. Okay. But I'm not confident in just what Christ has done for me in this life. And he has done much. He has blessed me beyond any blessings, mostly that he saved my soul. Saved me from eternity and hell. That's the single most important blessing. But he has given me a wife, a family couple of grandkids, career, all these wonderful things God has given me. But that's not my hope. My hope is eternity. Some people don't have what God has given me, but they're still wonderful, happy Christians. And that's the thing to be remembered. 
as happy as we are, if it's only these things, it's not worth much. What's really worth it is our eternal home. And he's delivering this message of a hope in the future to the folks in Antioch here. A sure hope in an unsure world. We have so many uncertainties today. We have politics that bother us. We have things from the nation of, of Israel, for instance. We see the turmoil over there. We see the global threats of uh, Russia, of China. We see all these saber rattling in our in our world. You know, this nation wanting to make moves on this nation, Ukraine. All these things are there. They all throw an element of uncertainty in the life. But with Christ, what becomes important to us is the eternity, the eternal nature of our home. And, and I suspect, sadly, I've had too many conversations with too many people in churches over the years to make me suspect this. Uh, I believe that too many people who sit in our churches trust Christ only on a super, superficial and highly intellectual level. People will agree wholeheartedly, yes, Jesus came to earth. They may even believe that he was born of a virgin. They might believe that he died, that he rose again. They might. They might not. They may say it. They may intellectually, yeah, this all happened. And yeah, he died for the sins of the world. People will go that far sometimes. But what they miss is that he didn't die for the sins of the world collectively. He died for those who would trust him and be obedient to him. Salvation is found in no one else, but not all who come, or not all who claim him really have come to him. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No question about it. That scripture is in several places. All who call upon the name of the Lord. But so many people don't really call. They make some kind of a half-hearted profession because they think it's going to benefit them, which it would. But there's no change in their life. If there is no change in life, my argument is, and always will be, if there's no change in life, there truly is no salvation within the soul. So as Paul was preaching that, he was talking about how people have rejected Jesus, renounced Jesus, and in a way, people who say, yeah, Jesus did all this, but don't trust him, they have rejected him. People who are saying, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, and there are many who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe all those same things, but they have never been transformed by the power of Christ. And it is those people, they're really miserable, ultimately, they will be eternally miserable, because they have never trusted that. They have never been transformed by the mighty power of God. And in not trusting him, that is a rejection and it is actually a renunciation. When they talk about Jesus in abstract terms and not personal terms, that is really a renunciation of Christ. No different than saying, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. People who live according to their own life habits, their own preferences, their own little key gods. That, those people are most miserable in many ways because they don't trust in the real Christ. They essentially have renounced him. And if that's the case, their resurrection might not be the resurrection they're hoping for. They may not even understand the resurrection. We will be raised to new life eternally. And however you want to flavor your understanding of the end times, I don't particularly care as long as you know that Christ is coming back. And he's going to take us bodily. Whether we're still alive on earth or whether we're underground. It doesn't matter. Whether our remains have been scattered to the land. It doesn't matter. He will bring our bodies back. We will have new and eternal bodies. We need to leave that. I'm afraid some people don't. And I'm afraid when they're resurrected, they will be resurrected to a judgment that they will not find pleasant. So wherever you are today, it's time to make a change. If you have never trusted in Jesus Christ personally, been transformed by the power of that he gives us through the Holy Spirit today is the day to make that change. See myself, see Pastor Sean, one of our deacons, be happy to explain it to you. One of our deacons' wives, or Sean's wife, my wife, <coughs> whoever. Okay. We can't continue to reject him. Rejection is eternal. 
when we die, we would have been given many a chances to do this. Because we're never going to escape the resurrection. You know, the last words that I just read, oh death, where is your victory? Oh grave, or death, where is your sting? We often say that at funerals. There's so much of this that we see at funerals. When we put someone in the ground, or we do a memorial service for someone who has passed, we often use those terms because there is no victory for death. Death is the ultimate end. I fear no death. I fear pain. Okay, I'll be honest with you. I don't like the idea of pain. I don't like the idea of dysfunction. But I don't like, or I don't fear, I don't have any fear at all of death because I know that at the moment of my death I'll be transported to glory. That is a wonderful thing, and I have that. So no matter what I have or don't have on this earth, I am not miserable. I trust Christ, but I have that future of eternity. So wherever you are this morning, if you've never trusted him, today is the day. If you trust him but aren't doing anything with your faith, today's the day to make that change. This is the preaching. Make a change. Be transformed by his power. And go out, step into those deep waters we sang about. Watch what Christ will do in your life and for the lives of others. Let's pray. Father, if we conclude this message this morning and look forward to more coming from the same passage, the extension of this passage, Father, we pray that you will be glorified in everything that was said. And I pray that everyone in this room will recognize that we each have some place we need to change whether we need, first of all, to come to you for salvation, and if that's the case for anyone here today, Lord, let today be the day. And if we need to make a better commitment, if we need to overcome the fear of stepping out with our faith and sharing our faith, let today be the day that we make that decision and then follow through with it. So we put these things before you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Indeed, we have no fear of death, because after death comes glory. And this final hymn we're closing with, the third, stand, the third verse says, When I stand in glory, I will see his face. There I'll serve my king forever in that holy place. First, remember we have to serve him here on earth. So let's stand together and close out the service, singing hymn 279, There is a Redeemer.
sending your son to save us. Thank you for the promise of the resurrection. We thank you for being our God, the God who truly cares and loves his people. Ask your blessing now as we dismiss. We pray that you will return us all together again as you will. I pray, Lord, that you will bless the time of fellowship that we have immediately to follow. Uh, time of getting to know what God is doing in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Heard it, they're probably here in uh, here in uh, so um, so.